my name is Gemma and I'm one of the education team here at the zoo. I also coordinate research at the zoo. Um, but one of my kind of extra little roles is that I work with one of the uh, British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquaria groups focused on sound. So I'm actually really excited to introduce you to some of the ideas uh, of sound in nature, why sound can be important for animal communication, but also for conservation of our wildlife as well. Uh, and a little bit about that group that I am involved in and how we are striving to make sound a really big part of the zoo experience and to make the zoo accessible to you guys through sound as well. So thinking about sound in nature. Now, sound can be a really complicated way of communicating when it comes... Oh, I skipped too far ahead there. When it comes to animals. Because a lot of our wildlife have got very different audit auditory abilities to us humans. So many of those animals can hear much higher frequencies than we can, and many of them can hear much lower frequencies than we can as well. One of those that can hear those lower frequencies are our elephants. And hopefully you'll get a chance to see our beautiful African elephants here at the zoo. Uh, but this will give you a bit of background about how they might be communicating with each other and with their environment as you see them there. And they communicate uh, and navigate their environment using something called infrasound. So infrasound are sound waves with frequencies lower than our lower um, auditory abilities. So the, below the lower limit of human hearing. So these kind of... Uh, kind of show themselves in vibrations and low rumblings. And because that sound channels itself through vibrations, elephants actually hear in a very different way to what you might expect. Now, when I talk to students and schools about elephants, uh, one of the things we highlight as an adaptation of an elephant living in the warm African savannas are those very, very big ears. When I ask students, why do you think elephants have big ears? 100% of the time, the first thing they say is to hear those predators. Now, this is where I get to say to them, actually, although elephants have big ears, they are there to create a big surface area to keep them nice and cool, to lose that body heat. Actually, those ears are not the, the kind of primary, um, primary sense of hearing. They listen through their feet. So those low rumbling communication noises that they use create vibrations through the ground, seismic waves that elephants can pick up through their feet and through their legs. A uh, very, very special kind of communication. So elephants create those inaudible seismic waves to us humans, uh, and they are able, able to um, move, they create those when they move or when they communicate with that rumbling noise. And elephants walking or calling with those low frequency rumbles create those distinct seismic signals. They can actually detect which individual is talking to them, uh, what they're trying to say, compared to when that might be a, a kind of abiotic, non-living noise. And tra transmission, because of that, because it relies on the ground, is affected by the geology of the area, so the type of rock, for example, that that sound needs to travel through. But it can also be significantly affected by low-frequency human-generated noises. So the noises of transportation, for example, can interrupt the communication between those elephants. But because of those vibrations that they can detect, elephants can detect vibrations from at least 10 kilometers away at times, depending on that environment. So that infrasound, roughly between 100, uh, sorry, 1 and 20 hertz, may be detected or generated by those elephants over 10 kilometers. And this aids elephants in social cohesion. So they might rumble together to find members of their group or to communicate those positive or sometimes negative interactions with one another. It can also help them to define their territory and to warn off other elephant groups. It can aid in reproduction. It can help males find those groups of females for reproduction. Uh, and it can also help where males are kind of fighting over a female as well, between the two of them. And it can help with resource utilisation. And that's a really important part there. That's not about communication between elephants, but that's about elephants communicating with the environment around them. And in this way, they can detect abiotic, non-living sounds in the environment. And some studies uh, predict this can be done over a few hundred kilometres. So they, I'll show you a video in a moment of how that works. Uh, but they can actually detect 
physical constraints, changes in the pressure, in the atmosphere around them. Uh, they can t detect the, the presence of storms kilometres and kilometres away. Uh, they can detect the, the presence of water sources as well. And it's believed that when elephants make big migrations across Africa looking for those salt plains or those water sources, they're using these uh, vibrations to be able to navigate that environment. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, we have ultrasound. And ultrasound uh, is used by many, many animals uh, that have that hearing ability above our upper limit, so above the upper limit of human hearing. Uh, you might have heard of this as echolocation. So echolocation is where animals use a, a high-pitched click or a, a high-frequency noise to try and determine the location of different objects within the environment. And that might be used for hunting, to find their, their friends in a group, but also to navigate their environment. And this is used by bats, uh, cetaceans, whales and dolphins, but it's also been recorded in some birds, uh, in shrews and tenrex, which are weird-looking hedgehog animals. And as I mentioned, they're used for many, many different things, so for hunting and for navigating the environment. And th for this particular example, we're going to have a look at a very clever dolphin, um, but I'm going to show you how dolphin echolocation works first of all. So here's my little bottlenose dolphin, having a little look at you guys in the audience. Uh, and this dolphin wants to navigate its way around the theatre. So first of all, what it will do is it will send a sound, so it creates pressure around the nasal area. It sends that sound up towards the blowhole, and just in front of their blowhole there, they have what's called the melon. And it's basically a large layer of fat that channels that sound wave, concentrates that sound wave as it moves out into the environment. Now, this sound doesn't sound like the normal kind of laughing uh, dolphin sound that we hear. That's much more for communication between individual dolphins. Uh, this sound is much more a series of clicks and whistles. Now, as that sound moves uh, around the environment, it bounces off and reflects off of different objects. So that might be plants and objects within the environment. It might be other dolphins. It might be fish or squid or crabs that the dolphins might be interested in eating as well. And that sound reflects from those objects. It comes back towards the dolphin, and it's actually absorbed in the lower jaw of the dolphin. And from that, that uh, absorption of those sound waves, the dolphin can start to piece of picture of what is in front of it. And using those sound waves, dolphins are able to tell the distance away from them in which an object is. Uh, they can tell the direction and speed in which an object is moving. And they can tell the density, the thickness of an object, and the size. And it's thought that a dolphin can tell uh, tell where an object the size of a golf ball is from the length away of a football pitch. So a very large distance there in which they can navigate and detect. Now, it's not just those pieces of information that a dolphin can tell. They can also angle their heads at certain different angles to send those sound waves out in different directions. And when they absorb those sound waves, it's thought that dolphins can even detect the exact species of a fish or of a, a cephalopod or a crustacean. Uh, so they can decide if that's a conspecific, a friend of theirs, or a nice tasty snack to hunt. Now, this bottlenose dolphin will also use uh, visual cues in the environment and will use its eyesight to navigate to an extent. But there are some dolphins, river dolphins, who live in much murkier water bodies who actually are thought to be completely blind. So they rely entirely on echolocation to navigate that environment. Uh, the Ganges River Dolphin, in particular, is an almost prehistoric dolphin species. And it's a species that's thought to be the last remaining member of its particular taxonomic group. Now, echolocation allows these dolphins to navigate the murky waters of the river without any eyesight. And new research has emerged which shows the complexity of the inner ear of the Ganges River Dolphin, which shows us just how they are able to do that. 
Uh, the evidence suggests that the cochlear spiral within the inner ear of the dolphin is quite flat and spaced out. And this is what it would look like within the inner ear. This green area is the cochlear spiral there. So that area uh, has a nice large surface area for those dolphins, but it's also a bit more, because it's flat and it's spaced out, it's a bit more robust. It's not got all of the kind of delicate features that some other animal inner ears would have. And it's thought that this allows dolphins to deal with lots of high, intense, uh, high intensity and high frequency noises within that cochlear canal. And it's thought that the shape of this ear may play a huge role in filtering out other sounds within the environment so they can focus and hone in on that sound that they are looking for through that echolocation, allowing them to see the object within the murky water. However, the, the Ganges River Dolphin is the only river dolphin that we currently have evidence of uh, being able to focus out those other sounds. So these other river dolphins, there are a range of different species of river dolphins across the planet, uh, and not all of them are able to focus out those other sounds. So these other ones will rely on hearing and on echolocation to navigate those murky waters, but they might be much more uh, affected by other sounds within the environment. And because of this, uh, our river dolphins are all very threatened and vulnerable species. Uh, because of the introduction of boats to those rivers, uh, the noise pollution that those boats create really makes it quite difficult for those do dolphins to navigate that environment. So the Ganges River Dolphin certainly has it right, uh, but the other river dolphins there are really quite sensitive to other sounds in the environment. Now, because animals have such fantastic audio capabilities at times, we can actually use their vocalizations, the noises they produce, for a conservation purpose. And this is called uh, acoustic monitoring. It's where we use the vocalizations and the calls of an animal to be able to estimate their population size and their range and distribution where we find those animals. And this particular project that I want to talk to you about today is a project that I worked on when I was at university uh, out in Madagascar. A really, really exciting project working with a very gorgeous, very unique species. Now, this animal here is an Indri lemur. It's the largest of all of the lemur species on the planet. It's about the same size as a five or six-year-old child. But even being so big, uh, because they live in very dense parts of the rainforest, they can be very, very difficult to visually see and to count and to learn more about. Now, even though we can't see them, we are very lucky that they produce this fantastic, beautiful, complex song that not many animals can quite match up to. And in this project, we were recording this song and using that song to calculate how many lemurs were living in a particular area. Now, before I tell you the details of that, I'm going to stop babbling on and I'm just going to let you listen to the beautiful song of this lemur. What you can actually hear at the end of that clip is another group of lemurs in the distance starting their call. So I was actually sitting under a lemur in, in this particular recording. Jerry, his name was, because uh, that's what you call a lemur, apparently. And uh, Jerry made his song with his partner uh, and their little young son that was living with them at the time. And as they finished their call, the next group would start and you'd hear that cascade of songs around the rainforest. It was a, a really beautiful uh, situation to be in. But basically what we did is we uh, went out to Madagascar with these tiny, tiny little recorders. So a really fantastic and cheap piece of technology uh, to support that conservation there. It looks like this. So a tiny, tiny little recorder. 
Uh, and this piece of tech, uh, audio moths, have actually really blown up. They're a really pe popular piece of tech now uh, in conservation, but also even here at the zoo, we're trying to get hold of some of these to do a bit more research on our elephants and how they communicate with vocalisations as well. But we packed these recorders into Ziploc bags and we cable tied them to trees across the rainforest. Uh, and they would go ahead for months and months recording all of those songs. And we can then look through the recordings through a piece of software to try and estimate the number of lemurs calling within each song and therefore in that group. And we were able to match, um, sorry, map different groups of lemurs across the rainforest. And I'll come to that in a moment. But I also want to highlight a really important part of this project was also working with local guides. So uh, through that, my time in Madagascar, I was living and working with the people who relied on that rainforest and who knew it like the back of their hand and of course once I came back to the UK we wanted to make sure that that project continued and we trained those local people to be able to use the recorders to be able to use the software so once we left the country that project can, can still continue through those local people and that gives them a lot of kind of ownership over the conservation of their local area as well. But we were able to make a beautiful map knowing um, the, uh, the details of that song. But we were also trying to better understand that song itself. So how that call develops as a lemur ages. Uh, we were looking for differences between the songs of a male and a female lemur. So we could tell uh, who we were listening to in that song. And also we could tell the age of a lemur from the way the song developed as well. And we also compared the locations of injury lemur to the lemurs we could see a little bit better as well. But this is what we were able to produce. Uh, so this is just a, a small patch of the rainforest. And we can see uh, six groups living there uh, with their kind of territory borders illustrated as well. You can see quite varied group sizes. So we have got a couple of monogamous pairs currently living child-free, lucky them. Um, and they would uh, hopefully go on to, to breed further and those little ones would move on when they were older. We have got some family groups. Uh, this one in particular up here is of particular interest. So we've got a male and a female there. We can tell those are adult males and females from that song. We've also got a little one who is just learning her song and just finished developing her song. So we were able to tell that was a young female because of the way that song developed. But we've also got a tiny little one here, uh, probably uh, about a year old or so, that little one who hadn't quite learned how to make their song yet. So we couldn't sex that particular individual, uh, but once that song was developed, we would then be able to. Now, creating a map like this helps us to be able to prioritise areas of conservation for that particular rainforest. So we might say over here in the southeastern part of the rainforest, we've got lots of really big groups of lemurs there that we want to uh, protect the habitat of. But we've also got quite a big group down here. We've got a, a mum and a dad and two little boys as well. And those little boys very soon would start to leave that family group and move out throughout the forest to find their own family groups, to find their own females and their own territory. So it's important to make sure for this group, for example, that we create wildlife corridors. We protect areas of the rainforest so that they can move throughout the forest, meet other lemurs and create their own safe uh, territory as well. So it gives us lots of information to inform our decision making. Now, animals communicate through sound a lot of the time, but there are lots of other forms of animal communication. So there might be visual signals, uh, tactile signals for animals, olfactory signals as well, so leaving smells behind to send that information. Uh, and animals have very complex communication patterns in some examples. And it's not just animals that have very complex communication systems. Uh, there's lots of research recently into what is now being called the Wood Wide Web, because we think we're really funny. Um, and the Wood Wide Web is a connectivity system, a network in which trees are able to communicate with one another. Now, they don't do this on their own. They do get the help of some fungi as well. So fungi are forming mushrooms and things, are forming huge communication networks and links under the ground. And trees just happen to be part of that communication link as well. Now, trees benefit from being part of this network because they are able to get lots of sugars and water from the fungi. And the fungi can also take sugars from the tree as well.
But we end up with this huge communication network in which trees uh, are transferring resources to fungi, fungi are transporting resources to trees, and trees and plants are also sharing resources between one another as well. So it really does become a big complicated network between all of these different organisms. Now, scientists have recently been able to map um, lots and lots of these fungus communication systems, even on a global scale. So we can see where these kind of big hubs are for these plants and trees and fungi, uh, and we can then highlight, again, areas of conservation concern. Fungi in particular is particularly vulnerable to climate change and to increases in uh, our global temperature. And fungi is also a really good store of carbon. So in terms of uh, thinking about the impact of climate change, if we start to lose those fungi, we are supposed to be expecting big, big increases in our carbon uh, release as well. So as well as being used to assess the effect of climate change on these systems, these maps are also helping us, again, to be able to uh, inform those future uh, conservation decisions. So we might use that information to decide how we go about forest uh, restoration projects, for example. Now, here at Colchester Zoo, sound is also a really important aspect of how we make sure everyone has a great day out and how we make sure that we are able to spread conservation messages quite effectively. So it can be a really valuable tool to us. Unfortunately, it's not something we've looked into in the past very much. There's a fantastic project uh, by Dr. Tim Rice, who is an anthrozoologist at the University of Exeter, and this project was called Listening to the Zoo. And Tim worked at uh, Paynton and Bristol Zoo and a number of smaller collections uh, across the coast as well, looking at uh, this question, can listening to animals help us feel closer and more connected to animals and to wildlife overall? Now, some of the key messages that Tim found through this project was that an acoustic mindfulness of other life forms can help us feel connected to wildlife. So being aware of the acoustic environment or the sounds that an animal makes themselves. And being aware of that acoustic uh, environment and that acoustic mindfulness can help us humans to recalibrate our relationship with nature. Now, we might often associate going outside with uh, being, having calming effects for us, with being very positive for our mental health. Uh, and we, don't, we haven't ever tested it, but I would like to think that the auditory effects that we experience there are a significant part of improving uh, the way we feel in that instance. If you are interested in hearing a little bit more about that, you can Google the Listening to the Zoo project, uh, and Tim has a really interesting SoundCloud blog available on there where you can actually walk around with him at Bristol Zoo, and he'll talk about the sounds that he's hearing at the time. But this particular project, it sparked lots and lots of further questions for us as zoos. Uh, why is this acoustic environment so important? How can we use it to our advantage? But also, how might it influence our our animals as well. So I want you guys to have a little chat amongst yourselves about what sorts of sounds do you associate with nature or with Colchester Zoo in particular? What do we think? And we'll do hands up like we're back at school if you have any suggestions. <laughs> Lions, fantastic. Animal noises are definitely a big part of our zoo environment. Can anyone think of any noises outside of those animal noises? Coffee machine. Coffee machine. Really good idea. No, definitely a really good idea. Yeah, Oliver. Your children screaming. I associate that noise with our home education sessions as well. Uh, so here are a few of the ideas that I thought of and that uh, some of us as a group uh, have thought of as well. Definitely those zoo animal noises, so lions, elephants, lemurs, uh, making the noises of their own. We, of course, add music to the environment as a zoo as well. Uh, whether that does improve your visitor experience, I don't know. I know it does my head in listening to it in the office, but if it gives you guys a good day out, then it's fine. Uh, but also people talking, people having a good time. I did have all of the different people noises on here, but there was way too many children screaming, babies crying, things like that as well. 
Now, some of the other noise you might not be aware of as such, but you certainly uh, will experience in the environment, maybe quite subtly, are those more kind of uh, environmental background noises. So staff radios that we use to communicate, our keys jingling. One of our members of staff says she can always hear me coming down the stairs because my keys jingle so loudly. Uh, road noises, we are very, very close to quite a main road as well, and a very large part of the zoo is exposed uh, to that road. So vehicles on the road and around the zoo, in that instance. Uh, flowing water within the environment as well. But some more specific noises uh, that you might hear in certain parts of the zoo or you might not even be aware of uh, are the noises of our filtration systems, our heating systems, our sea lion house at the top of the zoo has a very, very noisy noise. As you head out of the zoo today, up the main drive, before you go out onto the main road, if you just roll your window down there, you'll hear a very loud humming. And that is the noise of our sea lion filtration system. Uh, I started working here on on the sea line uh, section. So I don't hear it quite so much, but I do notice when I walk into work sometimes, I can tell I'm getting closer because that noise gets louder and louder. And our heating systems will make a kind of low hum as well. Uh, we've got the noises of shutters and traps. So our, um, our kind of doors and gates and things for animals opening and closing. Uh, we also have lots of building work going on around the zoo all of the time. So somewhere in the zoo, there'll be those mechanical noises, uh, drilling and banging and things as well. Uh, but one idea that uh, Tim Rice came up with, which I thought was really valuable to, to be aware of as well, is we've got our zoo animal noises, but we also have native animal noises as well. So the noises of our native birds and our bees uh, and insects, it's important, I think, that we stop and take a listen to those animals as well, because we are still in their environment in the same way that we are in those zoo animals' environment as well. But it's something you might bypass. You're not listening... You're not here to listen to a robin, you're here to listen to a lion, but it's certainly a noise that is still there and is a noise that we can use as a zoo to our advantage for your, uh, in, for your ex experience, but also for our conservation messaging. Uh, and I've highlighted some of the experiences you might find around the zoo. You're more than welcome to take a picture of this uh, to have a think about as you move around the zoo today. Now, there are some parts of the zoo that uh, I personally find, and I wonder if you guys might find it as well, they can be quite overstimulating in terms of sound. And those are the areas I've marked in red. So our indoor spaces, our orang house, our chimp house, our giraffe house, uh, and those pesky, noisy lorikeets, uh, the birds as well. Those are areas uh, that a lot of our visitors do say sometimes are a little bit too overstimulating, quite overwhelming. But there are certainly some quieter areas that you might want to spend some time in if you feel you are being exposed uh, to too much noise. So right at the top there, it's one of my favourite buildings in the zoo, which is uh, the uh, Feathers of the Forest building. People don't often go in there, so it should be a nice quiet place. But we've got some beautiful rainforest birds that really do appreciate that peace and quiet. So that's a nice quiet place to be. Uh, our koi pond as well, just next to one of the noisiest areas of the zoo, is also that much more calming area as well. Uh, as well as down the bottom of the zoo, near our nature area, so a nice big calming area to listen to the sounds of that native wildlife again. Uh, and our deer and pig enclosure, because it's right at the end, people don't often make it down there. So that can be a quite nice calming place to be. Now, of course, as a zoo, we want to use those sounds to our advantage as well. So in yellow are two of the places where I think we've effectively or not effectively, it's up to you guys, but we have used music to try and create a journey around the zoo. So to try and create that idea of being within a habitat and that ties all of the individual animals that you see there together. But I think probably our most effective in terms of conservation messaging are those areas in purple. And these are some of the areas where those animal noises really come into play. So our lions, our gelada baboons and our otters, uh, those two are particularly noisy animals. Uh, and they're not marked on the map, but they're uh, that bottom circle is where you can find our black and white rough lemurs, uh, a very noisy species there. So to some extent, I think perhaps in the future, we should really be thinking about letting 
those animals make those noises and using that opportunity that they create to create a story for our visitors and to put that conservation message forward. So if you would like to visit any of those areas or you do feel you need a bit of a calmer space at any point, hopefully those are some useful suggestions. Now, uh, some of the ideas that I um, have started to think about when it comes to listening to the zoo, the sound environment in the zoo, is thinking about how sound flows. So sound flows from within the zoo, outside, into the local community, and it flows from within the community into the zoo. So uh, noises of the road, for example, is something we've had to be very aware of when we have started creating new animal enclosures. Uh, when our sun bears moved into the zoo, uh, they weren't too sure about the noises of the road, so we put lots and lots of planting in there to kind of dampen out that noise, and they settled in much more quickly. But also, our noise does flow out of the zoo. And this is really important when it comes to thinking about the community. Uh, I live just two minutes down the road, and if the wind is blowing in the right direction, I can hear Bailey the lion roaring at some times of the day. So I think for the local people living in this immediate area, having that sound flowing out of the zoo can help to create a really strong community feel within the local area. Sound can also, uh, as we said, be a really useful and valuable tool to deliver those conservation messages. Now, it's not just having sounds there for people to hear, but also removing the sound can actually be a really strong conservation message. Uh, the idea of a fade, for example, so having sound diminish throughout a visitor's journey, having the animal noises or the noise of a forest quieten over time can help us to illustrate how the forest is becoming becoming quieter because of the loss of those animals and that biodiversity. So it can be a really valuable tool in really da you know, putting in those really hard-hitting messages. Now, animals are always listening to us humans as well. Uh, so where we might need to put those barriers up, like we did in the sun bears, we need to consider animal welfare at all times. So the noises that we make, the noises that we put into the zoo, we do need to be aware of how they influence our animals. Uh, but of course, I'm focused on the visitor stuff now. I used to be an animal scientist, but now I'm a people scientist instead. Uh, but sound also, and this was a really interesting idea from Tim Rice, sound offers a way that we can recategorize animals. So in zoos, we tend to group animals based on uh, their biology and their taxonomy, so how similar they are to each other, or their habitat that they live in. And that's a new idea that really we think helps us to... to um, hammer in those conservation messages. But actually, potentially putting animals together based on the noises that they make could really change and introduce a new way to how people experience the zoo. So that's certainly an idea for us for the future. And as a result of all of these findings and these ideas, uh, BIASA, the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquaria, created the Sound Focus Group. Now, I sit on this committee uh, alongside a couple of other professionals, and the idea of this group is to try and encourage research amongst our research students, amongst our, amongst our research staff, uh, that better looks at sound. Now, a couple of the people sitting on this group uh, really want to look at how sound affects the animals. Uh, but as I said, there's lots more aspects to sound in the zoo. I sit on the group as the education and conservation kind of messaging advisor. So that's uh, what I'm supposed to be there talking about. But I've also been thinking a lot recently about that visitor experience and how sound can influence our well-being. And I think this is a, a kind of area to watch in the future, that zoos will hopefully become a green spaces for people to access uh, for their mental health and sound can be a really important part in creating that experience. So in the future, some of the areas uh, I'd like to encourage my students to have a look at is looking at the journey we can create around the zoo using that sound, how we can improve your experience with that sound. How sound can help us to deliver those conservation messages, so helping people understand those issues that we're trying to express, some quite difficult issues that potentially sound can help us to deliver a little bit more easily and more accessibly. Uh, to look at how silence and gaps in sound can potentially be an even stronger way of sending across those conservation messages as well. Uh, and also having those quiet spaces for people to access. I want to know a little bit more about the importance of that for people in their day trip at the zoo. 
But a lot more research overall is needed to evaluate the effect of sound on the zoo visitor, on your experience and on those take home messages. Now, we would also love to know how you guys are accessing the zoo in terms of the auditory environment today. So if you have any comments as you're wandering around the zoo, like noises like that, uh, if you have any comments about how you were able to access the zoo environment, uh, any positives or any negatives, please do contact us at education at colchesterzoo.org. Uh, we are constantly striving to improve our accessibility and of course there are many different ways in which we can do that. So if we can get the help of you guys who are on the ground experiencing the zoo um, with your uh, abilities and impairments, then we can make sure that the zoo is accessible in every way for all people. So if you do have any comments you'd like to send to us, our email address is education at colchesterzoo.org. But for now, I managed to keep that in 45 minutes. I didn't ramble too much. So I'd like to say thank you guys so much for coming along. Thank you for listening and for engaging uh, with me through that. And I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day here at the zoo.